Hey everyone, welcome back to Data and Donuts. My name's Aaron. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Yara Hiano. We're here today to talk about student learning outcomes, but before we get into the interview, I'd like Yara to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about himself. All right, thank you, Aaron, for the opportunity. Yeah, it's been a while. We've been, we've been around, we've been around. So I, I, I really appreciate your uh, ongoing uh, support and, 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 and friendship over the years, I, I really do. Uh, my name is Yara Keanu. Yes, I'm the SLO coordinator from Santa Ana College in Southern California. And uh, I've been in, in this position on and off since about 2014. I've been uh, interested in, in, in working with uh, student learning outcomes since about 2010, maybe 12. And I, uh, I am coordinating annual SLO symposium, as many of you may know, uh, which is the, the, the uh, yearly conference during which we, we, we talk about what it means to assess student learning. When COVID hit last year in March, I realized that I didn't have to coordinate anything anymore. I didn't have to worry about lunches and breakfasts and colleges that would take us. We started uh, collaborating online and, and that's certainly the silver lining as far as I'm concerned for um, SLO discussions because we were ready to step in and just simply have them. So we started with about, I don't know, 15, 20 people kind of like meeting here and there on Fridays. And by now we are about at, at you know, 70 to 100 people pretty much uh, every, every time we meet. So I'm, I'm, I'm certainly optimistic about, about the, 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 the conversations and I think we are having meaningful ones in that. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak about this topic. Excellent, that's super impressive. I'm gonna to have to jump into one of those meetings and just listen in. I'm sure there's gonna be excellent feedback, conversations and the like. So- Anytime. So when we go about this interview, faculty, you know, faculty are great in homework, assignments, midterms, and then there's finals week. Why are we talking about SLOs? What can SLOs offer that current grading and assessment structures can't do? Right. So uh, student learning outcomes assessments, student learning outcomes, they are really the, the, the statements about student learning. And grades are not. Grades encompass everything that happens in the course. This may amount to answer to a question, how well students fulfill requirements of the course? As a result, learning is inferred. It can be implied that students with good grades learn something, but there is a problem. I'll give you an example from American Sign Language, course where students learn how to communicate using American Sign Language and what culture of deafness is. These two concepts are two distinct topics in the course. As a result of instruction, students can communicate using American Sign Language and they can analyze the culture of deafness. Now, different students will achieve each one of these competencies to different degrees, right? So, what does, for example, a grade of B plus tell us about how well students acquire one or the other of the two competencies? And that's a course with two major concepts that students need to learn about. What about courses that have more than that? B plus designation simply complicates things even further. Then there's a question of what it is that students learn as a result of their participation in the program. Just imagine that a strong reader will be with uh, good grades, will, will get them just because they've been reading well since grade school. What about institutional learning outcomes? Students who leave our institutions should be able to think critically, solve problems. What about small group leadership, community engagement? These are skills, these are competencies that actually can be taught. Then there is the issue of what it is that students bring with them to the course. What if students are already performing at the B level? We just don't know it. We just don't ask. So what do we learn by the end? So what do students learn by the end of the course? John Dewey said, we should not expect our students to learn only when we tell them when to learn it. We are human beings. Learning cannot be stopped. We just need to start paying attention to it. So SLO assessment data is just that, data that tell us what students have learned. GPAs, persistence rates, course completion, diploma attainment, that's not learning. Just think about it. 
This data can be obtained without even talking to students. That can be called student achievement. It has nothing to do with learning. Excellent, excellent. And after roughly 15 years of SLO implementation, faculty are still struggling with SLOs. Why is that? Oh, that's a loaded question because there are lots and lots and lots of different reasons. First of all, there has never really been any support for the effort. The reason there has not been any support is because there are no meaningful discussions about SLOs with lasting effects. So as I just was saying earlier, when students show up, we record the data and that becomes the data we already talk about. When they persist, they stick around, that's data, we talk about it. When they leave in certain numbers, that's data, we talk about it. When it comes to student learning, we really don't have any meaningful ways to express that. So lack of fund funding is probably the main reason. But then there is the question of leadership, accountability at different levels in our, in, in our system. From the early days, when you think about it, from years back, the concept of SLOs was shrouded in really murky definitions. It was always treated as an added on to everything else that faculty are doing. And then there was no meaningful discussion about how to make it work. Just let me maybe be clear about one thing. Questions that faculty and administrators ask about SLOs at community colleges in California are not specific to our system. Higher education institutions and their accrediting bodies in the United States and abroad are asking exactly the same questions. So until we get funding, nothing is going to change anytime soon. The issue is just simply too large for us to handle on the backs of faculty and people who are willing and able to engage in intellectual discussions on what it means to assess student learning. Things will change, just not fast enough, I'm afraid. Then think about the implication of us not paying attention to student learning in the context of equity discussions that we are having. We are putting so much effort to make sure that students go through our systems in efficient ways. Yet, questions about what they learn are still not asked, let alone answered. And, and I think that is, is a key component. But there are some champions. There are some diamonds in the rough. And if you lead to our next question, are there success stories with this where you've actually seen faculty dedicate themselves to say, to ask the questions, to explore, did students really learn and have there been improvements over time? Like for example, we, we were alluding to this before even our interviews, what have they done to really facilitate that learning? Can you give me an example of that potentially? So unfortunately, um, Aaron, I, I, I cannot. I am, I, am, I am disappointed in myself that I cannot give you any, any, any more insights on, 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 on this. Unfortunately, there really isn't anyone, and, and, and I'm just afraid to, to generalize here because I'm sure that there are pockets of brilliant work that's, that's taking place. The problem is that because of funding, because accountability, because of politics, because the workload, because of the way we staff our colleges, faculty versus administrators and so forth. There's, you know, people come and go all the time. We have all kinds of issues. So these efforts are just simply not scalable. They cannot be forwarded. They cannot be replicated readily, let alone the fact that we just simply, again, don't have a system conducive to this. So um, about, I don't know, outcomes for the most part still are where they were. 10, 15 years ago, uh, there may be, again, pockets here and there, but unfortunately, I, I cannot tell you. The reason I, I, I like that question is because I think it's time for us to wake up. This could be a wake-up call. Okay, if accrediting body requires and we can't comply, then what's the story? Why are we doing this to ourselves as a system? And if this issue is so important, because obviously it is, we do need to know what it is that, that our students are learning. And as a matter of fact, students would be the first ones to know what it is that they learn. Again, we just don't have a system that would allow for these conversations to happen. We just don't. So I'm optimistic. I'm sure there is, there is, there is things that are going to happen in the future. As of right now, please let me know who does this well. 
I have to push that question back. And no, it's, it's a great response. And I think it really is a wake up call to really tell us where's our future going to be. And that's really the final question I have related to this is what is the future of SLOs? Either it sounds like there's a fork in the road coming ahead. And so I'll ask you if we're going down the same road and then, um, and then more of an optimistic, as you said, you're more optimistic. What does that look like? Right. So, so uh, I, I, I suppose that really the, the, the degree of optimism that, 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 that I feel uh, is still there simply because like I, like I mentioned, there are, there are really brilliant people in the system. There really are. There's just so many administrators and faculty that are just, 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 just uh, absolutely outstanding uh, individuals who, who can take on the discussion. They really can. The challenge for us to create a system within which those discussions would be uh, permitted and would, would, would be allowed to happen. So I am optimistic about the competency-based education, the concept that Chancellor's Office is, 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 is forwarding. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that that's going to amount to something, but please observe, there is money behind it, right? So let's just be optimistic in, in, in that realm. Now, again, the question is going to be how scalable those efforts are, you know, what type, what, what, what really the, the, uh, the group of, of, of initial adopters is going to, to, to develop and, and to what extent those, uh, the, the, the practices that they develop will be scalable so that they can be adopted at, at, at our colleges. But, but I tell you from, from what I know about it is it's, there, are, there are just no easy answers and uh, the work is going to be tremendous. It's going to require a lot, a lot, a lot of change, uh, starting with the classroom, ending with the highest levels of, of administration. We are talking about different faculty workloads, uh, different way we issue transcript. Um, just, just pretty much anything, which means that if we are talking about the change that so profoundly impacts our system, at the end of the day, we may not do it as a system in isolation. This will have to uh, impact uh, our conversations with K-12 colleagues, Cal State, UC system, and other institutions of higher education throughout the state, if not the country. So. Um, I, I really see this as a, as a bright road ahead. I just, I just can't think of anything better that could possibly happen to, to, to our system. Again, our students need, need to be accommodated. Our students are really asking for, okay, I need to learn because I need to get a job and I need to do it fast. I can't be waiting for courses to end and programs to last for years. I need a job tomorrow. This is COVID time. Everyone's suffering. We need to step up to the plate, change the system to accommodate the, 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 the pleading of our students. And I completely agree. Uh, my college is one of the eight colleges that is going to be taking that on. We put forward a, a competency-based education management and really rethinking as the degree they want on certificate rethinking general education to more contextualized that's the conversation we're having now is don't just give them a science give them a contextualized science how it relates to the job how they can learn the skills through the theoretical frameworks of that and really open their minds like with communications communications for management what does that mean you know it's a blend of technical communications project management communications oversight feedback emails that type of communication we use your theoretical concepts of our general education, but blend it directly into an applicable or experiential learning environment. And that's really where, as you know, with competency-based compared to a, a traditional classroom, and I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to do that, but you don't get a grade at the end for whatever you did or did not do in the class. You need the competency and map that out the entire way through, and you have to pass all the competencies to make it through. And what the beauty is, is we see individuals who've worked in the system, have experiences, and they can accelerate in certain areas, but then they can refresh, remind, and grow in others and really emphasize, you know, it's your time, it's your place, and meeting them where they are, like you said, and, you know, getting them where they're ready, because some people need to focus on more concepts or may be able to, like I said earlier, accelerate those concepts. And, and I think that is, like you said, really the meaning of learning is can, do students feel able and confident to do because when they get into the job, we want them to be able to be confident to do or job or whatever they want to do in life. Um, 
to just, you know, be happy, excited, and able. And I think that's where outcomes assessment will, will blend across. And so we'll have to talk about competency mapping and competency units another day, because there's some cool stuff I'll share with you about that. But as we go to our final two questions that relate directly to this program, sure. the first question is, how do you say the word data? Is it data, data, data? It's, there's no wrong way. There's no right way. I, I think I, I said it data. I, I yeah. I'm, I'm not sure why it must have been the way I learned English. I, I somewhere along the way, it just stuck to me. It's, it's, it's data. It's not, I mean, I know datum, but I, I, um, yeah, I would stick to data. Excellent. Excellent. Good advice. That's what I've used so far. So hundred percent. And so then the next one is what's your favorite donut? Oh, I don't really eat donuts to be honest, but if I were to, okay. I'll admit it. It's bear claw. There you go. <laughs> if I were. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Yara, it has been so fun to talk with you. I swear we could do this for hours. This is great Good. insight. I look forward to having future conversations, maybe on program outcomes, mapping, post-grad assessment, pre-post, all that, and then maybe some institutional outcomes, looking at that broader scope. So I'll be calling you in a bit and we can set that up. But thank you again so for being on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Excellent. And everyone, thank you for, for viewing. Please hit the subscribe button below. Have a great day.